<laughs> We've had some beautiful music tonight, folks. Boy, <laughs> that's good. <clears throat> if you have your Bible, turn to 1 Peter chapter number 2 and verse number 1. 1 Peter 2, 1. First Peter chapter number two and verse number one. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as into a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. A stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they, are, they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Father, this is your holy word, Lord. I ask you to bless it to the hearts of the people and those who hear it. May it come alive in their soul. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Lest there be any doubt in your mind who he's addressing here in First Peter chapter number 2. Verse number 10 settles the issue clearly, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. There is no question that he's referring to Gentiles. Jewish believers are also present here, but Gentile believers are the main focus of what's going on in 1 Peter chapter number 2. In 1 Peter chapter number 2, the apostle Peter, where the Lord Jesus said, Peter, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The apostle Peter tells you very plainly he's not the rock, that Christ is the rock. And here we find it in 1 Peter chapter number 2. But what we find here is some mysterious things. I want you to notice what it says in verse number 5. 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse 5. Ye also as lively stones, contrasted in verse number 4, to the living stones. The Lord Jesus Christ is a living stone. You must understand this in the context of the incarnation when God became a man. The life of the Lord Jesus Christ as he lived on this earth was a life that was different from the life he had in heaven and the life that existed before. The Lord Jesus Christ is the God-man, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. As God the Son, there never was a time when he did not exist. He has always been. I am not an Arian. I do not believe the Lord Jesus Christ came into existence at any time in the past. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord Jesus Christ is the eternal one. He's the Word in John chapter number 1. The beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Bible said and in 1 Timothy chapter number 3 with that controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. But when God became a man, when God was incarnate in human flesh, one started breathing that had never breathed before. That was the God-man on this earth. It was a life that Satan had never seen before. It was a life that he could hardly comprehend. It was the life of one who started on this earth as the God-man, the Son of God now incarnate as a man. Remember this. It's very important. It's very important. The man did not come down from heaven. God came down from heaven but the God-man went back to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. It's a mysterious life. It's a life that cannot be put under a microscope, cannot be, cannot be, uh, cannot be examined as someone else might examine a life. Satan is very good 
at knowing what the natural man is all about. Satan understands the natural man. Satan understands how to talk to the natural man. Every one of us in this house tonight are natural men by the, by, by the, by the birth, by the natural birth into this world. And, uh, and many of us tonight may very well be carnal men carnal babes, and we may be carnal in the sense that even though we're born again, that we're saved by the grace of God, we're still living a, a fence-straddling life, living a carnal life. Satan fully understands that. He can pick it out in a heartbeat. He knows when he's dealing with a natural man, and he knows when he's dealing with a carnal man. Satan is fully aware of that. He can comprehend that. He sees it all about him. But there's one that Satan has no comprehension of whatsoever because he can't see it. The Bible says here that is a stone a lively stone, a living stone. A stone has no life in itself. A stone is a lifeless thing. Yet we have a life. We have a stone that's alive. This tells me that the life that God gave to the Lord Jesus Christ when he was here 2,000 years ago defies description. It defies understanding. It defies explanation. But he's alive nonetheless. The Lord Jesus Christ was the living one. In Revelation chapter number 1, he said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and note, John, I am alive forevermore. Amen. He's literally saying, I'm the living one. I'm the one that lives. It is because I live that ye shall live also. This is a life that is given from the Son of God. This is a life that is made available to every last one of us tonight if we've been born again. The new birth is simply the birth of Christ. In other words, the life of Christ that's been given to you, infused into your soul. It is the life of the Lord Jesus Christ arisen from the dead. Because I live, he said, ye shall live also. It's not a life that you earn. It's not a life that you produce. It's not a life that even comes from this world. It is a life that is absolutely and completely and totally a mystery except the fact that you know it exists. Deep in the heart and the soul of every man, there's a hunger and a desire to know something greater than himself. Deep inside the soul and heart of every man, he looks to a higher person than himself. He looks off into the heavens. He must be deceived by Satan. He's got to be lied to. He's got to be deceived. He's got to be brought down to not have a natural inclination to look into the heavens. Romans chapter number 1 says that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. In Romans 1, it says that they are without excuse for God has made himself known in his creation. Men know instinctively that there is a God. They've got to be lied to and deceived out of believing that there is a God. But Satan has no concept whatsoever of the life that is in you right now. He can't see that life. That life is not, cannot be put under a microscope. It cannot, be put, it cannot be examined. And all he can do is witness what you do and what you are in this world because he could do no more with Christ. And when he came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, if thou be the Son of God, are you really who you say you are? Somebody said, well, that was nothing but mockery. No, I don't believe it was mockery. I believe it was Satan desiring to find out who he was dealing with. It was Satan wanting to know, who is this one? Who is this man here? He's unlike any other man that I've ever seen on the face of this earth. Who is this one that I'm talking to? After 40 days in the wilderness, he came to him when he was weak. He was hungry, and he suffered the same afflictions in his flesh that we do. He got tired like we get tired. He, get, he got hungry like we got hungry. And after 40 days, Satan came to him and said, turn these stones into bread. He thought he had him where he had every other natural man. He thought he understood him. He thought he understood what he was about. But he did not understand what he was about because he didn't know who he was talking to. The reason he didn't know who he was talking to because nobody had ever been on this earth before like the one he was talking to. He had never in his existence ever dealt with one like he was dealing with here. He was dealing with the God-man. He was dealing with God Almighty incarnate in human flesh. The Bible says that God Almighty came down to this world and incarnated himself in human flesh. Human flesh is like stone. It's something that comes from the earth. Human flesh originates here. But the life of the Lord Jesus Christ did not come from his mother. It did not come from this earth. It came from above. The life that came down into that body that God gave him. The Bible says, a body thou hast prepared for me. God prepared a body for his son. And that body that he prepared for him was a sinless, perfect body that did not have the same connection with human flesh that you have. For when you were born, you were born under the original curse. It was passed to you. You were cursed the very day you were born because you were born of a human being. Romans chapter number 5 said, Death passed upon all men, and that death came from the original Adam. 
but the life that came into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ came from above. It was the very life of the Son of God coming down into the body of a man. And that body, therefore, was animated by the life of Christ. Satan does not understand that, never has, and never will. And neither do you if you don't know the Lord. But inside your soul, deep down inside your very being, there's something tonight that says there's something different about me. There's something that has changed inside me. There's something that reaches up into the heavens and cries out to God, for he is my Father. I cry and say, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, for my sins have been forgiven. There's a life living inside you that cannot be extinguished in this world. And the reason it cannot be extinguished in this world is because it did not come from this world. It came from above. And those of you that are not lively stones don't have a clue because it is an enigma wrapped up in a riddle that cannot be understood. It can only be experienced. I cannot explain to you the life of Christ. I can't explain to you the life of the new birth, but I know I have it. And I know tonight that I am one of those lively stones. I know tonight that I have in me what I did not have in me for 27 years. I know that I have passed from death unto life. And I know that I know that I know, hallelujah to God, the Lord Jesus Christ, he lives in my soul, amen. So the apostle Peter talks about stones. He talks about construction. He talks about building buildings. He talks about habitations in 1 Peter chapter number two. These are important things. When the Jews set about to build buildings, they dug a foundation and they laid the stones and up the structure went, put a roof on the top of it and they had a building. But here the apostle P Peter uses a simile, a metaphor of a different kind of building, one that is not made with human hands, a building that cannot be constructed by a human being, a building that is altogether different. As a matter of fact, when the building is built, a human eye cannot even see it. The natural man can't even, he can't even comprehend that building that has been built. But if you're part of the stones of that building, you know when you're in the wall of that building. You know when you're in that building and you know you're part of that building because that life of Christ is dwelling inside you right now at this very moment. And it cries out to God the Father, I know you, Lord. You're my Father. You will always be my Father. And the Lord Jesus is my Savior, my Lord, and my God. And I gladly, gleefully take my place at his feet. Amen. Like I preached to you this morning, at his feet. Oh, my, my, what you can learn at his feet. So the apostle Peter gets into the stones. And he talks about how wonderful these stones are. He talks about the Lord Jesus Christ being a stone. Now, if you don't have spiritual vision, if you're a natural man, if you're a carnal man, you don't have a clue what he's talking about because who sees any stones in this house tonight? No stones in here that the natural eye can see, but there's life in here. There's life in here that cannot be explained away. And not only is there life in here tonight, but there can be a presence in here that cannot be explained away. I've seen the presence of God show up in a church like lightning. I've seen the presence of God move across a congregation like a wave in the sea. I've seen the presence of God come and I've felt a fresh air move into a place knowing that it's God coming into the midst of his people. He comes into the midst of his people like that like he does nowhere else because he's not welcome anywhere else like he is in here. When God's people come together with a hunger for the Lord, two or three are gathered together in his name, he will show up. That's a blessing for us that are saved and born again. The Bible says that he's a living stone and he's disallowed of men. 1 Peter chapter number 2 and verse 4. They don't want him. They've rejected him. Men have always rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. He's cast aside as a worthless stone. They're going to build a building, but their building is going to be something they can see with the eye, and touch with the hand, understand with the mind. But the Lord Jesus Christ is a stone that God has placed. Put it here to build a building. Yet they don't want him. The builders rejected him. They won't have him. They want no part of him. They've always rejected him and always will. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit of God to build a hunger in the soul of a man for the salvation that comes from Christ. So they can't do anything about it. He's the, the Bible says here that he's, the, he's a foundation, a cornerstone, and a headstone. But still to this day, there's no place for Christ, no place for him. Every year I marvel how around December the 25th, the world gets so excited about buying and selling and trafficking in goods. Yeah. But those of you that know the Lord Jesus Christ, keep in mind, he was born. The angels did shout and they did sing. And for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. You can use it as an occasion to teach your children about the birth of Christ. 
You can use it as an occasion to tell them about the true one who came into this world 2,000 years ago. And you can also use it as an occasion to teach them how that men will always pick out the part they like and reject the real meaning. They'll get the gifts. They'll take the, they'll take the excitement. They'll take the feast, but they'll disallow Christ. Amen? That's the way men are. They've always been that way. And there's nothing wrong with the gifts and the feast and all the rest of that. But the bottom line is, folks, if all you want is fluff, you're not going to get much. Don't you want the meat? Don't you want what it's about? Don't you want the heart and the soul of this thing? And the heart and soul of it is the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's still disallowed of men. First Peter chapter number 2, though, and verse 4, it said, Now watch carefully. To whom coming is into a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Now the song goes, they, church, they searched all over heaven, and they couldn't find willing to die, one willing to die for our sin. That all, that sounds good, makes good singing. But the truth of the matter is, there's only one that could die for your sins. It's not that they lined them all up and said, who'll go? That wouldn't work. There's only one who could go to the cross and die for your sins, amen? And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible says that God chose him. Notice carefully verse number four. Chosen of God and precious. The Lord Jesus Christ is precious to the Father. The Father puts great value in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is through him that he communicates with men. And it is through the Lord Jesus Christ that God bore the sins of mankind. It was through the Lord Jesus Christ that God speaks to mankind. And it's through the Lord Jesus Christ that God saves mankind. He saves through none other. There's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. Those murderers over there in Paris, France, that wantonly killed with cold blood, all of those people shot them to death, blew them up with hand grenades. Those murderers think that they went off to meet with their virgins that were waiting for them. I'm sorry, folks. They were deceived in the beginning. Now they're in hell. They're screaming and begging for mercy, and there is no mercy. There's only one name, folks, only one name, only one name. Let me tell you something. Please listen to me. Don't listen to your government. Don't listen to your government. These are Muslims that kill those people in Paris, France. And the Muslims are invading this country. And the president of this country is bringing them in by the tens of thousands. And they are invading Europe. And, and, and some of the European leaders now are waking up. And a lot of people in Europe are demonstrating and marching in the streets. And they're trying to say, hold on. We don't want this Muslim invasion in Europe. And that's exactly what's happening. Sometimes when you look at the TV screen and the news media, you'll see that 80 to 90% of all the, all the people of, of, these, of these refugees coming in are young men. 16, 17, 25, 30 years old. And one of the men involved in blowing these people up and murdering these people in Paris, France, had a, had a, 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 a what do you call that thing, the passport, and he was a refugee. He was a refugee. Do you want that in this country? There's only one name given under heaven. It's not my faith and your faith. It is the faith. There's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. It is not the Christian religion opposed to the Muslim religion and this religion and that. You can have all the religions. There's just one living stone, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. You say that's a dogmatic, uh, dogmatic narrow-minded statement. The Bible's dogmatic and narrow-minded. There's only one name, just one way, and there's only one living stone. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter number 2 and verse 6, Wherefore, it is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay, God lays in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth in him shall not be confounded. The cornerstone is the crown stone. It's the stone of identity. The cornerstone is the stone where they usually put, the, put all of the, uh, the, the, they want you to read the names, the, con the contractors, the dates, and the dedication and all of that. It's on the cornerstone. So it's the chief stone. It's the greatest stone. Without the cornerstone, it's just a building. But with the cornerstone, you've got an identity to what's going on here. The Lord Jesus Christ is that chief cornerstone. In other words, if it had not been for him, it wouldn't, we wouldn't be. <laughs> if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ, there'd be no church. Without the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no gospel. Without the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no hope. Without the Lord Jesus Christ, the next time you go to a funeral, think long and hard. You will never see that loved one again. 
Without the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no resurrection from the dead. Without the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no heaven. Without the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no forgiveness of your sins. And without the Lord Jesus Christ, we have no hope. But thanks be unto God, he has risen from the dead. Amen. Now the Bible said is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Amen. And John, he says in Revelation, I have the keys in my hands of death and of hell. Amen. That's authority, folks. That's authority. The whole book of Revelation was written for the early New Testament church to be passed on to the rest of us, but to give them great comfort and hope because they had been persecuted so much under Nero and Domitian and those that followed to show them that their Lord Jesus Christ, who was no longer walking on this earth, was seated at the right hand of the Father and issuing forth all power and majesty and glory down upon this earth. Amen. So he is the chief cornerstone. In 1 Peter chapter number 2 and verse number 7, the Bible said unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but just in the past few weeks, a billionaire, he's a billion, worth a thousand million dollars, plus whatever he is. Of course, that won't buy him one moment in heaven. Can't buy him forgiveness of sin. Can't buy him any peace. Can't buy him the things that money cannot buy. But he's got a lot of money in this world. He has bought two of the most beautiful diamonds on the face of this earth, each one of them worth tens of millions of dollars. And he gave them to his seven-year-old daughter, to a seven-year-old daughter who could hardly appreciate the value of these diamonds. But make no mistake about it, he'd better be careful. He'd better not let that girl wear that diamond ring or whatever it is out away because there are many out there that would snatch that girl up, folks, and they'd ne he'd never see the ring. He'd never see the ring again, but he'd probably get his daughter back dead. You see, friend, this world puts value in a dollar bill. But I'll tell you what's precious to me tonight. You can take my money away. You can take my health away. You can take my house away. You can take a lot of things away from you, from me, but you can't take the Lord Jesus Christ away from me. Amen. You ought to look at some of the documentaries that I watch about these names and these walls and these dungeons and these dark holes. And you go down there and you find where they've scribbled in there, Jesus, 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 how I love thee. In the darkness of a cold, wet dungeon, the last final hours where they died, I'm talking about 300, 400, 500, 600 years ago, and it's all about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You see, they could take their life away. They could take their light away. They could take everything away from them, but they couldn't take Jesus out of their heart. Amen? He's precious. What would you give for him tonight? Would you sell him? Would you sell him for something? Did you know that Americans have been selling Christ for a long time? Did you know that if the Christians in this country, just the Christians, this coming election, 2016, if just the Christians in America that profess the name of Christ went to the polls, you could put anybody in you want to. But I told you about this morning, I saw on the back of this car, Ichthus, the fish, and it had, it had inside, it's got, uh, it's got Darwin, it's got the legs coming, and a mocking, mocking, mocking the fish that the Christians used in the first century. And then it's got its little shield up here that represents his church. And I thought to myself, I wonder who'd you vote for? And then I went on down the street just a little bit further and here was one, here was a little, here was a little, uh, a little bumper sticker talking about a basketball league that some of these churches have out here. A basketball league. And then I looked at, I'm awful for this. I'll tell you I am, I'm terrible. I read everything I see. I make, I put it together. I try to figure out what's going on. And right up next to it, it said, and I'm a Democrat. And I thought, oh, my, oh, my. You say, can Democrats go to heaven? Sure, they can go to heaven if they've been washed in the blood of Christ. Everybody that's been born again goes to heaven. But there's the judgment seat of Christ we have to stand before. And it's not about a Democrat or a Republican. It's about, my friend, what you believe and what you hold true in your soul and who you support. If I go to the polls and I vote for a baby killer, blood will be on my hands. If I go to the polls and I vote for somebody that embraces sodomy and pushes sodomy on the American people, that'll be on my hands. You need to be an informed voter when you go to the polls. There was a time the Democrat Party in the South especially, and the reason the South was so democratic is because of the Civil War. All you've got to do is go back and read some of the history. 
You'll find out that the Republicans in the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. Yeah. You'll find out that you had what, what, what was called radical Republicans. These radical Republicans wanted to make the South pay for the Civil War. They wanted to make them pay. Abraham Lincoln, from everything we've read, says that Abraham Lincoln did not want that. He wanted to reunite the nation. He wanted to heal the wounds of war. He wanted to bring the country back together again. But John Wilkes Booth cut that short. And he, and he, and he assassinated in Ford's Theater uh, the president just a few days after, after, the, after, the, after the end of the war. And Abraham Lincoln died. And so we had a problem come up. And that problem was that there was an element that wanted to make the South pay. And the South saw it as the Republicans making the South pay for what had happened in the Civil War. And so what happened? Well, of course, this is exactly what happened. The South drew together around a party, and it was the Democrat Party. And that Democrat Party spoke for the Southern people. And even at a time, they called them Dixiecrats. Ever heard of a Dixiecrat? Sure you have. These are Dixiecrats. And they, and, they, and they stood for the Southern people and for the working man. And you can understand that. But here's the problem. That's, I'm talking about something that's 100 years old. Over time, the Democrat Party becomes corrupted. And it's given it, even in my lifetime, I've watched that corruption. There was a time when there was a lot of high, moral, upstanding, honorable people that were part of the Democrat Party. But now, the Democrat platform is anti-Christ, anti-God, pro-abortion, pro-sodomy, everything that you're against as a Christian tonight. So it's neither the Republicans or the Democrats because there's so many Republicans tonight, they're just as sorry as they can be. They're sorry. They're sorry as they can be. And you say, well, preacher, you're not supposed to be preaching politics from the pulpit. Are you a citizen of America? For him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Do you have an obligation to vote as an American citizen? You have an obligation to vote. So when you go to the polls, you need to go to those polls and you need to vote your convictions and you need to know who you're voting for and why you're voting for it. So it's no longer the Democrats for the working man and Republicans for the rich man. It's a whole, the whole thing is a mess. It's a sorry mess. And so the only thing you can do is pray, Lord God, get somebody in there that believes what I believe. Give me somebody I can vote for on election day. And ask God to give you wisdom. Ask God to give us somebody. Somebody pray tonight. Why don't you pray tonight that God will raise up a standard in America. I'd like to see my nation. I'd like to see my nation go right again, wouldn't you? I'd like to see America go down the right path again. It was on the right path at one time. I'd like to see that happen again. Pray for God to raise up a champion for us, somebody that will stand true to what you believe, stand true to, to, uh, uh, to, to, your, uh, to your convictions in Christ. He is precious. Amen. First Peter chapter number 2 and verse number 8. The Bible said, A stone of stumbling... A rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, wherein do also they were appointed. There's two things I want to call your attention to here tonight. The stone of stumbling is the stone of the Jews. The saddest case in the world of the Jewish people, because the Jewish people know the scriptures. The Jewish people are the ones who walked in the light. We're Gentiles, we're ignorant. We're ignorant. Did you know that Julius Caesar, when he went over into, into, into Great Britain, Julius Caesar wrote about his trip into Great Britain. You know who I'm talking about, Julius Caesar. He went up into Great Britain, and he said that when they looked across, he looked across a lake one time. He said he looked across that lake, and he said he could see the painted faces of the pagans that were jumping up and down and cutting themselves. And he said he could see the baskets that they had woven out of, uh, out of uh, just, you know, wood. And he said they would put people inside those baskets that they'd woven out of wood. They'd put people in there and they'd set them afire and they'd burn them alive and they'd dance around that basket and praise their God. That's the kind of ignorance that Julius Caesar had to deal with. Now, Caesar was no great light. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the Pontifus Maximus and all of the gods of Rome. But he was trying to say these are debased people. And they were debased. They were debased. Do you know where the word pitcher comes from? Pitcher comes from the Picts who were part of the people that lived in the British Isles at one time. That's where the word pitcher comes from, a Pict, P-I-C-T. Well, what was that, preacher? These people had paintings graven all over their body. They had pictures all over their body. 
from the front to the back covering their body. And so, they, and so these pics that were so covered up with all of these pictures that man made, you know, engraved in the skin with ink and whatever, they were so covered with these pictures that the term pic came from, picture came from the pic, and that's where you get it today. And here's what they used to do. When they went into battle, they would throw themselves down across the, across the barriers and the people behind them, their compatriots, would come right across the top of their body and go right into battle. They threw their lives away like it meant nothing. They had no value in human life. And the reason they had no value in human life because they didn't know what a human being was. Do you realize, folks, that man is the only creature that's made in the image of God? Do you understand that to assault a man, in essence, is to assault God? Do you understand that? A man is made in the image of God. God puts a, he puts, he puts a barrier around a man. He puts his mark on a man, and he says, okay, you kill a dog over here, that's okay, that's a dog. But you don't kill a man like you kill a dog. If you're going to kill a man, you better have a good reason for killing a man. You don't just take men and put them together and just butcher them. Muslims do that. He said, when, you get, when you're dealing with a man, if that man is a murderer, he's done something worthy of death, then kill him. If that man is a raper or he's a, he's a child molester, he's one that is worthy and guilty, worthy of death, then okay, you've got a right to take his life from the face of the earth. But be careful. When you're dealing with a man, you're not dealing with an animal. The people today don't know the difference. I look like a fool when I get up and preach to you. To, the, to this world, I've noticed how this, this thing has moved. These people kiss their dogs and kill their babies. You're living in a pervert generation. They don't understand. They say, well, now, wait a minute now. Don't you appreciate the fact that that dog is a living being? Sure, it's a living being, but it's not a man. One man, one single man is worth more than every animal on the face of this earth. But until you can really get that in your soul and in your spirit and understand what I'm talking about tonight, You'll never get it because you're being bombarded constantly, day in and day out, day in and day out. And I have never in my life seen so many people licking dogs in the face as I see on TV now. Must I remind you what dogs eat? You better give a second thought before you lick your old Fido in the mouth. I mean, I saw a bumper sticker not too long ago, and it said, do you know where your cat is tonight? <laughs> That's not a man. That's not a human being. That's an animal. And there is a difference. It is a living biological creature, but it does not have the image of God. It is different. And so, therefore, when God saved you, he renewed that image in you. Hallelujah to God. So we should respect humanity. We should respect a human being. We should be very careful when it comes to taking the life of a human being. Christianity, when it's preached right, preaches the sanctity of a human being. It preaches the sovereignty of a human being. It preaches the fact that a human being has been elevated above all creation because it's made in the image of God. And that, my friend, is something that we should take Write it down in our soul and in our spirit that if you're going to take a human life, you better know what you're doing and you better have a real good reason for it, a real good reason for it. If a man kicks your door down and comes in to take your wife and your children, shoot him. If some man comes to the schoolhouse and he grabs your little girl and he's taken off down the street with her and you know you'll never see her again, shoot him. That you have a right to do. Every right in the world as a human being. But just because he disagrees with you or he's got a different religion than yours or he has some, uh, or he's, he's your competitor or, or he, uh, <laughs> I won't get into too much detail with this stuff, but you know, you don't like him. You have no right to kill that man. You have no right to kill him. You have no right to kill him. Can we think on that tonight? Can we make a difference? How many of you following what I'm talking about tonight? You're talking about it. We got people sitting on death row, been on death row for 30 years. Been on death row for 30 years. 
We got people right now that are demonstrating for a cop killer up there. I think he's in Chicago, somewhere up in that area. He killed a cop about 30 years ago. Now they're demonstrating to get him out of prison. They're trying to make it, they're, they're trying to turn it into all kinds of stuff that it's not. You go into these mosques, you read the Koran, and you're going to listen to people that will tell you to go out and blow them away, take their head off, and kill them. I don't understand why the FBI and the National Security Agency and any other, uh, any other agency like that in this nation, I don't understand why they are not actively monitoring everything that's being said inside these mosques. When these killers came over here from Saudi Arabia and killed 3,000 of our citizens up there in New York City, 3,000 people died at their hands. They attended mosque in this country before they ever went up there and killed those people. Then on the other hand, I'm like Will Rogers. All I know is what I read in the papers. They may be monitoring them for all I know. They would be smart to do that. And when, when, when this president lets 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 Syrians come into this country, friends, you better be careful. You better be very careful. Some of these people are no doubt in my mind are either connected with ISIS or sympathetic with ISIS, and we will pay a dear price for it. Remember, he has his bodyguards. You don't. And if it was left up to them, to many of these elite up there in Washington, they would take your Second Amendment rights away from you to where you cannot defend yourself. If those people over there in Paris, France, inside that theater, if they'd had four or five men in there, even with just handguns, they could have stopped the carnage. A few people might have died, but there wouldn't have been any 80 or 90. They could have shot them to death and stopped it. You say, is that Christianity, preacher? You better believe it is. Once again, I remind you that the Lord Jesus Christ called his disciples, and he said, who has the sword? And one produced a sword, and he said, it is enough. That sword was to tell them that you are going forth as sheep among wolves. Protect and defend your families. And that's what we need to do. Amen. He is precious indeed to those who believe. The stumbling stone, and then he's the smiting stone. Hallelujah. What is that, preacher? The smiting stone is the stone that smites the Gentile kingdoms on its feet. We started talking about this morning in the book of Daniel. We'll get into it again next week. The stone smites the image on its feet, and that whole Gentile structure, Gentile kingdoms come crumbling down in a moment. In a moment, they just come falling down. In other words, in a 24-hour period, the whole Gentile, times of the Gentiles, comes to an end because Christ smites that image on its feet. And when he does, it's going to come down. He's the head of the corner. He's the head of the corner. Being the head of the corner, he is the one who went before us and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. I love the old stories of the West. I always have. When I was a little boy, I used to look at the Wells Fargo, uh, 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 what do they call them, stagecoaches, and the uh, six, eight horses pulling the stagecoach. I used to think that was the most beautiful thing in the world. I've always had a fascination with the West. Always have. You either do or you don't, and I have. Can't tell you why, I have no idea. But I've loved the West. I've loved the American West. And I've loved the fact that they were pioneers. I've always loved the pioneer spirit. Where these people got out there and they marched for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles. Walked, breathing the dust of the, of the ones in front of them to go start a new life. That's a pioneer. Not knowing what awaited them. Indians on one hand, thirst on the other hand, weather on the other hand. Food, on the other hand, all kinds of problems awaited these people, yet they drove on because they were pioneers. They went into a new land, something new. They paved the way. They, they, they started a new life. That's what Christ did, folks. He's a pioneer. He went into a new world for us. That new world exists before him as he moves into it. In plain words, as the Lord Jesus Christ takes another step, something else comes into existence. As he takes another step, it comes into existence. He is the archegos. He is the leader. He is the one who starts and creates by his very existence and by his very being. 
he goes forward and it comes into existence. All behind him goes into oblivion. The only life that there ever will be in eternity is the life of a saved, born again child of God. The Bible said the memory of the wicked shall rot. They'll wind up in the lake of fire and brimstone where there is no hope and there is no future. He is the head of the corner. I'm going to follow him. Hallelujah to God. I'm going to follow him. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd use what I've said tonight to the glory of God. Bless thy righteous name. I exalt thee, praise thee, and lift thee up. In Jesus' sweet name I pray, and for Jesus' sake I ask it, and amen. Amen. Let's stand up tonight, folks. Page 398.